Good morning, everyone. Another version of Ask the Millionaire. I'm Mark Kramer. I do family business and entrepreneurial consulting. I'm excited to speak of all, to all of you this morning. On my right is the real brains of the outfit, my bulldog, Roxy, who is sitting here feeding me all of the information I need to tell you. So I hope you all are having a great and safe day wherever you are in the country. So let's get started with our first question. Here's a description of the business and background for this question. I have, the submitter is Lisa Nitzwitzki. And Lisa writes, I've been reading Entrepreneurial Leap and I definitely have the traits of an entrepreneur. Every trait he went through, I could think of an example where I applied that specific trait. Going through the book, it talks about the types of businesses there are, product or service, B to B, B to C, high end or low end. I realized what stood out to me, product and service, B2B and high end, as I'm a stickler for quality over quantity. I'm also answering all the questions at the end of the chapters and, and writing them down. It made me realize the type of company I want, but now I'm stuck. Here's the question. Here's why I'm stuck. What happens if you're drawn to an idea for a business, but have no experience providing that business? So. Here's what I would do and I actually did. I've started many different ventures where I had zero experience in the field. I started an insurance venture where I raised a million dollars from an insurance company. It was to insure small business bank accounts against cyber theft. What I did is I researched the idea and I looked to see if anybody was offering it. When I found that there was no product available like that, I developed a business plan and I looked for a partner who had expertise in the area. I did the same thing with a financial services business that I started where I raised $3.2 billion. And it was a, a company that bought, uh, fact, bought invoices from people. Again, no experience in that area. I looked for a partner who understood what I was trying to do and we partnered together. And that worked out great. And I've been in other businesses where I ended up learning on the job. So if you have an idea and it could be a very scalable idea, look for a partner that you could go in with that could teach you the business at the same time being credible with investors. If you're doing something that doesn't require investing, then go work for somebody who is in that business to learn that business. I once had a cousin who went into the restaurant business with no experience whatsoever. And within seven months, he had blown through $250,000 and went bankrupt. It would have been much smarter if he had worked for a restaurant, loaned all the ins and outs before he got into it. But you might have an idea that's only good for a short period of time. So you might have to jump in and learn on the job. That happens to a lot of entrepreneurs to go and do that. But the best thing to do is first get experience in that field so you can minimize the number of mistakes, have more credibility, really find out if that's what you want to do. The second thing is go find a partner that would go in with you and see if they would be willing to believe in the same dream that you have and take it from there. Again, don't let anything stop you. The best thing you can go and do is take that leap and see what happens. Best of luck to you, Lisa. The second question is from Rowan Furneth. Rowan's background in business tells us the following. I've received an inquiry to export a famous Hungarian chocolate brand to chocolate, to China. I've contacted the manufacturer brand, received pricing and packaging details. I'm aware the Chinese partner could go directly and purchase selling purchase from the factory, but they rather have me do sourcing and logistics. They want to focus on selling the product in China. I've heard time figuring out, I've had a hard time figuring out what is a uh, percentage of profit I can calculate after I added logistic and, and other costs I incur. I can multiply it by 1.3 or two. The obvious risk is what is within the threshold of them accepting the price for the work that I do. How much is the profit margin of a distributor? So that ranges across the board with the profit margin for a distributor. If you're talking software, the profit margin could be 50%. If you're talking food, it could be 
um, double low, low, low double digits, like 10 percent, or it could be even lower than that, single digits. So it all depends on who you're talking to and what the industry is. So you're doing a lot of the right things. Figure out all of your costs and maybe add on at the end before taxes a 20 to 25 cent percent markup so that you're guaranteed to make some money off of this because you're bound to be wrong in some of your calculations. And so that kind of margin should allow you to at least make a, a profit, maybe even a decent profit at that. But the best thing to do, which is what you are already doing, and that is put together a spreadsheet, figure out all your costs, your marketing, your travel, any employees you have to hire, if you have to rent space, everything, and then put it all together and then add 20, 25%. And then after the first year, I always find that when you're running a business, you learn everything you ever needed to know in the first year of running that business. And after that, it was all pretty much predictable. So best of luck with your new venture. The next question is from Tatiana Blood. Her background question, her background and question. I'm developing a new women's fashion accessory. I'm taking an existing product and adding a feature I believe will make it better. I want to know how can I substantiate that it has the ability to be a profitable product line? What are the ideas I can use to improve the concept so I don't sink a lot of money in this, into this and lose money? Well, there are a couple things that you can do. One is go and create a demo product that you could go and show people and then see if you could get advanced orders. This is very common. In fact, you see it a lot on when uh, people are doing crowdfunding and they're just raising money for, it could be a watch, it could be a new surfboard, it, it could be um, a new line of clothing, whatever that is, they show people what it is and then they go and raise money around it. So if people actually wanted this product, they can go and say, mm -hmm. I'll pre-order for this. And then you have a sense. But if you go and put it out there and nobody buys it, well, then you know that that probably isn't going to fly and you don't want to waste a lot of money. I know a gentleman who's come up with a, a, a product and he sunk $75,000 into it. And he had done a small survey, but he didn't really ask anybody if they would pre-order this. And this product is $75,000. And right now he hasn't been able to get any sales. So even though you could do a survey and always remember this. When you do a survey, a lot of people want to be encouraging. So they say, yeah, I'll buy it. But when you ask people, are you willing to write the check now? Then those people sometimes say, well, I'm not so sure if this is for me. Uh, maybe down the line, I need to see it first. And therefore, you know that you can cut those people out right away. So only the people are willing to put that money out. We've seen it with a Pebble watch that people are willing to put that money out. I myself put money into a product from a local woman in Philadelphia who created a piece of jewelry that a woman could press and tell people that she was in trouble. And she had set a goal of raising $35,000 and raised over $300,000 and sold 10,000 of these products without anybody touching it, just seeing the picture of it. So that's what I would do um if i were you which is go and get put together a demo of the product or pictures of the product and see if anybody's willing to pre-order your product before you make this full investment next question is from kimberly patterson kimberly writes with a lot of changes happening in the world i'm getting a lot of questions from others seeking guidance and i'm wondering if I should use this as an opportunity to earn extra income, and if I did, how do I determine how much to charge? Thanks. Uh, so a lot of people are making money charging for their expertise. So if you have expertise in starting up a business, what I might do if I were you, and I've done this myself, which is start a, a develop a website. It's pretty inexpensive. I did it. I uh, created a, a site in order for people to send me their business plans and PowerPoint presentations. It's called pitchtomefirst.com. 
and I put it out there because people are always asking me to take a look at their um, PowerPoint presentations, their business plans, and review them and give them feedback. And I figured if I'm getting all of these people, my time is worth something. Why not just charge something uh, to go and do that? And so I created the site. Cost me about $200 to do this with GoDaddy and launched it. And I made a couple thousand dollars. Uh, actually, I made a little over $3,000 in three months by launching this service. So the next thing you need to do before you even launch that service is see what are other people charging for a similar service. And now because of the internet, it's so easy to go and find out what other people are charging. And you can even contact them and say that uh, I'm thinking about uh, offering this kind of service, get somebody who lives in a different part of the country. What are you charging? And make sure wherever they are in the country that it kind of mirrors the area that you're in. Because what somebody might charge in North Dakota is certainly different than what they would charge in New York City. So again, I think you should definitely get paid for your time if you're putting a lot of effort into it and the people want a lot of detail when they get the feedback from it. But if it's just, hey, tell me what you think about this, well, there might not be people willing to pay for that. So best of luck uh, with your new venture. Uh, definitely, you should give it a try. Next question, Trish Murray. Trish, I sell false eyelashes and other beauty supplies online on my website. My business used to be very profitable and I took a downturn. What do you do to get your mindset back to positivity and start playing offense in life? Here's what uh, I would do if I were you. Couple things. One is I would write out a plan for how you're going to go and sell these products online. And I would go and leverage my existing client base. Hopefully you have email addresses from people. I would put uh, that uh, your products on Facebook because it sounds like a business to consumer type product. I would um, put it on Instagram and I would uh, tweet about it anywhere that you can put this information up. You might even consider creating a YouTube channel and giving people advice on how they could use your product and having people come on and interviewing people. The best thing to do, I find, because I go through the same thing. I'm a serial entrepreneur. I have ups and downs. In my consulting practice, I have ups and downs. What I immediately do is I start reading magazines like Inc., Fast Company, Entrepreneur, to spur my creative juices. I go and develop a plan for a new product line or a new service or a new way of selling uh, what I'm already uh, marketing. And that reinvigorates me because if you just stand still and you sit on the couch and you just watch TV, you get depressed. You wonder, you know, will I ever get out of this? To go on the offensive, you got to put together a plan you got to take advantage of all the weapons that are out there, the social media, leverage your friends, family, uh, other clients that you've had, um, any kind of contacts and get the word out. And you'd be surprised. People will start coming and buying from you again and you'll feel much better. And then you'll even come up with even better ideas. So take the time uh, to write a plan out and don't lose heart. You know, the, uh, soon enough, because of all the brilliant people in the world that are working on this, COVID will be over. But it's a great time for you to cement relationships and maybe even knock the competition out by being creative on your own right. Well, best of luck uh, to you, Trish. The next question is from Alana Smith. Lana writes, I have an online academy and teaching school, and I'm expanding by starting another company and unrelated industry while also adding a new membership component to my online academy business. To do this, I want to make sure none are negatively affected by my focusing and working on another. What are things you should do to balance all this out? Thanks. So you know you only have so many hours in a week, especially if you've got family, you've got kids, or you have a significant other. Uh, and a lot of times you just want some more work-life work balance. What I have found, and I have um, many different ventures that I run simultaneously, is that I would like to put everything on paper, write everything out that I'm going to do, what all the responsibilities are, what all the steps are that I have to take to execute 
whatever this is that I'm working on and see how much time that would take. And then I start segmenting my time during the course of the week. Now, for me, typically, I work Sunday through Friday and Sunday is a day that I line up. I do my planning and I line up emails that have to go out during the course of the week and I put them in the queue and set the time for when they're going to go out. So I do all of those things. So the best thing that you could do and what I always do and recommend is write everything out, take a look at your schedule, and you have to be very disciplined. Don't take calls that aren't germane to your business. And I'm not talking about from your mom and your friends. I'm talking about, you know, when people are calling you to sell you things that you really don't need. All of us feel like we should be nice to those people because they're all trying to make a living and we're understanding of it but you have a limited amount of time. And frankly, by telling them no, it allows them to focus on somebody who will say yes. In sales, a lot of people like to say a no is as good as a yes because you don't waste any time. So again, write everything out, put it all at, put, uh, segment your time during the course of the week and stay disciplined. And once you do that, you'll feel organized. You won't feel scattered. You won't feel that you're being overwhelmed. And you'll be able to handle it. And once you add on the next one, then you'll find to add on more and more isn't that difficult. But there becomes a point that you there is a breaking point. And so you'll find it within yourself what that is. For me, I can run five ventures, seven ventures simultaneously. But I'm also working 12 hours a day, six days a week. But I love it. And so that's what gets my juices going. Well, thank you, everybody, for tuning in. I look forward to speaking to you next month. Hope all of you have great luck, great success, and stay healthy, and I hope your family stay healthy as well. Thank you again for listening. Take care.